Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you support these videos, you can join the YouTube directly at just $1 a month, or you can go to patreon.com slash tawahado, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. Those with no allergies to reading can sign up for the Substack, that's aksum.substack.com, a-k-s-u-m dot substack.com today. I'm joined by that Duri Yelij, that Ethio boy, and Deta Nazari. Good to be here. <laughs> nice to have you. You know, um, there are many different topics that you and I could talk about, but I think a good place to start, because we kind of grew up knowing each other, but we weren't you know, the closest until one day, it's my first day of work, and I'm working for one of these education nonprofits and they're like 300 plus people in this mess. And this dude is staring at me and turning. And I wasn't sure. I was like, is he Indian? Is it first? And then I got to look at his face. I said, oh, he's definitely Ethiopian. I was like, where I know him from. And we started talking and we're like, I think earlier that year we were at a, at an Ethiopian party together. And that, yeah. that was crazy. So let's talk about that world, man. What, what got you interested originally in serving in an education nonprofit? For sure. Um, are we are we not saying the organization? Yeah, you can say it. You can say it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can say I, I'm doing it for you, bro. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, fair, 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 fair. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. So I'll, I'll use my discretion. So city year. Um, well, you know what got me in it. You may have known, especially when we when we met up at first. You know, I think we were really chopping it up about like policy and politics and all that. But like, I initially when I graduated from undergrad, I, I planned to get my PhD, and that was like I was on that mm -hmm. roll track. I did what I needed to do and was ready to even just start applying. But being burnt out and really just realizing in academia, they're not really doing shit for nobody outside <laughs> of like publishing and generating knowledge. Like that's important. Like, don't get me wrong, but like concrete real world effects, nothing much. Like I remember I'd even taken a seminar on institutional failure, which was dope. And like one of the things we covered was schools, right? And like the charter school, you know, that whole debate in the, the 2010s. And I was just like, man, like, a great Play way it out a little bit for people who, who aren't familiar, because I could give at least a small big picture. I know my mom retired a couple of years ago, was longtime L.A. Union teacher, yeah. and her school transformed from a public school normal to a public charter and then back again because the union she was affiliated with was very anti-charter. But for a lot of people on the outside, it's not clear. Like we have the independent schools, the private schools, the religious and the non-religious variety, public schools of charter and non-charter variety. What what was your take at the time, you know, about charter schools? Oh, like my stance? In, in yeah. Our... Did it change at all? I don't know if it changed well, over time. You no, know, it did change. Um, I think it became more nuanced overall, but I think definitely in college, I saw charter schools as an issue. Like I was definitely more on the left, still am, but like not the same way as you know, like I'm more of a pragmatist generally, but I, I was like um, charters, they're taking away from public education, funds we could be using, you know, really referring to what's that, that stat around um, like dollars per pupil. And it's like more money means like better education, right? And so a lot of inner cities to use that language uh, and their schools are being robbed of these important dollars that could be like making a difference. So. That's where I stood like going into city year where I ended up. And I think a lot of it, like engaging in discourse with you and some others, definitely, I think just around, um, yeah, we could say like the free market and things like that. I don't adhere to that, but I can be swayed on some level on some issues. And so I think for me, what I figured out was, especially when we were in the the space that we were in and the setting we What's were in, up? <laughs> um, we were at, yeah, where we were at, I saw a lot of, you know, well-meaning teachers, but a very rigid curriculum. Um, I think very rigid uh, rules overall. I think a one size fits all. And I think where I ended up was just sort of like certain communities have certain needs and a blanket one size fits all may not fit that. In fact, we may need something radically different. And so I really like the idea of what charters could do with regard to doing things just totally different and like being creative. So I became more open to them. Now, I didn't see them as a fix. But I felt like if you're in a community, you shouldn't have to just send your kids to some shitty public school down the road, like just to be politically incorrect about that. Like you should have options, right? Which is why I'm, I'm for on some level, even vouchers, like to take, if your kid wants to go somewhere and you want that option, like go ahead. And so I think I became much more flexible in some of that thinking, just seeing 
not to be hyperbolic, but just how dire and desperate things were on the ground. It's like we need like options now. Systems aren't going to change altogether, but this could be a means towards that, like to do something innovative. That's right. I want to come back to the vouchers thing, but briefly while you're talking about this to give people a very practical example, and I'm not just trying to hype my man's Ethio boy so much. This is just the facts of the situation to highlight what it is that he's saying. Um, one of the many requirements, I remember whether it's from the nonprofit city or like you said, or whether, you know, that's being acted upon by the local legislation of the public school is the sort of written agreement that they had, for example, is that you would mentor and tutor in math and English, 10 students who are not the absolute lowest, but who are on the lower end, especially of the testing spectrum. Mm. Now that's like the theory. And, and, uh, and a common theme I bring up in this podcast and elsewhere is where people bring their theoretical abstractions to practice and they will keep trying to make a circle fit into the square or vice versa, however that analogy goes. And the, the kind of what I think is Hebrew Bible based and general Semitic way of thinking is the reverse. It's moving from practice to theory rather than from theory to practice. So their theory is you got to mentor and teach these 10 kids math and English. You realized one of the kids assigned to you was literally in third grade, if I'm not mistaken, and yeah. illiterate. So yeah. how, how did you respond and why did you respond? Because we could say in a little bit, you, you created flexibility where there was inflexibility. Oh, that's, I really like how you worded that question because I don't even think I've conceptualized it that way in a while, but I think you're, you're onto something for sure with my approach. I think, you know, we're supposed to dedicate a certain amount of hours, if I remember correctly, to like each pupil and ELA and math, right? Some kids you can cross over and do both, but this one was definitely on my reading list, right? In terms of like any literacy, he needs to like, just know not just the alphabet, but like how to read. So essentially I was burnt out and like, was what's disillusioned right with, with just like the demands placed on us and like I, I could have honored it and it still did was able to meet sometime but i think his hours i think that i had with this person it far exceeded anybody's like i spent all my time individually with him right the other kids they'd get like what was sort of left i guess of what, what i could provide not that they were neglected but I, I favored this individual right and we weren't supposed to do that um, in fact, a lot of our tasks, depending on the classroom you're in, you're supposed to really like be monitoring everything going on in the class, not just like pulling, pulling kids aside to like do work, like you're really engaged. And I just isolate with the kid and just do what we could do. And yeah, he, he did learn to read. That was awesome. I, we, and I, I credit others in our group because he was in our after school program too, getting a lot mm -hmm. of support around that. I, I could make shout outs to want to like say names or anything like that, but there were people that were really helping him too. But, um, yeah, I mean, we I had to get around that. And I wasn't the greatest at tracking the data, um, but there were questions like, okay, this kid is getting a lot of time. What's up with that? Like, why? I'm just like, he needs it. Like, you gotta go where the needs are, right? I mean, if you wanna talk about equality, equity, whatever it is, it's like, once again, a one size fits all. Like some kids need more. Um, some kids, you can't just have a certain prescription of what will help them, especially if they're just so far behind. It's like, you kind of just gotta like throw away whatever you're given and just like scrap it and just do something basic even. Right, which is what I did with him, but yeah, you you can characterize this differently. Definitely, don't let me put words in your mouth. But from this situation, and even today, I'm working with a with a charter school. You know what I mean? Um, in the pandemic here, in this little pan dulce, and I've I've seen very generally speaking this desire to think that there's absolutely no difference amongst the sexes and that basic idea that biology is irrelevant play out into the way that a lot of these places are managed. And it seems to be there are two big management styles and it certainly leans in one direction. You know, I could uh, quote, I will restrain myself, but I could quote some Umar Johnson oh. right now, for example. Oh, uh, and, and this could this could lead to you know mental health discussions that we're going to have, but the way in which a lot of black boys are more likely than not overdiagnosed by predominantly a lot of white women, and when you approach a situation thinking that both sex and race, I think race 
you know, it's reified and there's a lot of false elements to it, but I think there's something there. Sex, I think is huge. I think it's huge. And the fact that we ignore both of these things and, and when he showed the numbers and, and we've seen it, you know, we'd seen it in, in the sped, even at that school that we were at, it was interesting that, you know, not all disabilities are visible and you have to navigate this very difficultly. But it appeared to be that there were more Hispanic boys with visible disabilities and more black boys with invisible disabilities. And the people who are diagnosing them often seemed to be well-meaning white liberal women. And it, and it raises a question as to um, what we bring to the table if, if it's leading to these outcomes you know, is it something inherent in these people or are there some questions we're, we're not asking? And so I think it's like a tough love versus a nurturing element. And it seems to be a lot of people in charter schools and public schools in general, the ethos is never give up on any child. I, I saw this with our after school program, We've gotten a little bit of the hubbub, right? With the team lead and the manager one time. And what's funny, you were on my side in this equation. And, and for me, ultimately the well-oiled nature of the machine was more important to me than my individual opinion. And I even would rather not express my opinion and like submit to the hierarchy that was there than to play it out and have my voice. Like, like I don't need my voice heard just to be heard. I know some people need that. And there's probably some literature on that, that was guiding that sort of behavior. But for example, the average after school program that I saw of like 23 schools we were in is 20 something. Our after school program hit the limit of 75. And then we allowed many different siblings in oh, okay. into that program. And then you have a number of behavioral issues. And the question is, if you were to make an example of let's throw a, a crazy number, five to 10 people, and let's say you expel them from the program, surely those individual people's lives will be less good. No question. But the question is, what about the lives of those other 75? And I think that's a tough decision to make that a lot of people don't want to make. So I wonder what you think about in education, and then we'll get to the mental health point of view, like tough love versus, you know, being more nurturing. Like the idea, are you allowed to give up on anyone? Like the way I explained it to a friend who's an educator as well, it's like you have $100 and you have 100 people. You can give $100 to 80 people if 20 people are not acting right, or you can give $1 each to 100 people. And I think many people in the environments we were in would say, make sure each person has at least $1, which is appears to me as someone who like has high standards and loves excellence and greatness, like you make more people uh, serviced, but mediocrely, mm -hmm. rather than distilling more energy into one person. And, and I'm sorry, this was a long little rant, but I brought this up from the idea that you applied that on the micro scale of you had 10 kids and you poured more into the one rather than spreading yourself thin over the, over the 10, which you easily could have done. And it would have been more by the book. Uh huh. So uh, it, it's, it, it was, I'm glad it was long winded and you brought up a lot, I think of important points. So I don't know where I'll start, but cause I, I think on the whole, cause you started sort of talking about this distinction with so black boys having like invisible diagnoses, we could say, or intellectual disabilities, whatever it was, versus, um, I mean, don't get, now I don't even want to get in trouble. Latinx, <laughs> Chicano, she kind of whatever. Hispanic, I'll be problematic and say that because that's like the worst, honestly. Hispanic boys, we could say, might have more obvious ones. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way, honestly, but what I will say, I think from my subjective experience was that um, at least at our at our school, a lot of the black boys were more behaviorally challenged or like they they struggled in that way more overtly. That's right. What I meant, yeah. Well, that doesn't mean they don't have a learning disability of some sort. Mm -hmm. I actually believe they do on, yeah. on some level. I, I think it's the yeah, the way the presentation mm -hmm. of it, that's even to use mental health language is very different. Maybe that's culturally so. I assume it is on some level. Um, and, and I think the other way we saw it and what we had to handle <laughs> was like the behavioral outbursts, right? Or to be politically incorrect, it's what's just a bad kid in terms of not knowing how to behave and what's someone who's like 
I don't want to use the R word or anything like that, but like with an intellectual disability, yeah. right? Yeah. I think we we tend to get in that binary, right? Which I don't think is as helpful personally, at least reflecting now, mm -hmm. right? Because I think they all have something they're struggling with yeah. intellectually for sure, and definitely social, socio, social, emotionally, right? To the to the question, what you, what you're really asking though is like, do we toss out some to save the rest? Or I think if I remember my mm -hmm. language as a 22 year old or 23 year old, it's do we let some bad apples spoil the rest, right? That was like, that was the language I used at least. And I think where I stand on that now, um, I think given how stretched we were, and I might add how ill-equipped we were, we weren't <laughs> we, we just weren't, like, we might've been book smart and had some life experience, maybe had worked with kids on some level. I think for the majority of us, that was new. And so I think with that said, given that we were, we were busting like, we couldn't take any more. There were some kids that should have been thrown out, honestly, because to me it was important enrichment. And in some ways it was a privilege to like participate in after school. Right. Yeah. Um, and that if I remember even correctly in the nitty gritty, and I, I still hold true to this on some level, we didn't have consistent expectations. I think that was like a big thing as well, or we would bend for some kids. And I think where I felt, I felt some kids were getting off easy, um, I felt like, the, honestly, like there was some guilt around it, whether it's white guilt, class guilt, whatever it was. And I think I had made comments like this behavior, this wouldn't pass in other communities. Like, why are we allowing that? I've changed yeah. since then. Admittedly, I know the role of trauma is a big thing um, in terms of how kids get socialized. I think I want to talk to you in this, I guess, session or podcast, whatever you want to call it, about yeah. um, about. I think the implications of corporal punishment and what that, <laughs> yeah. what that does to one's ability to self-regulate, right? So I have a lot more nuance now. Um, I think, so to answer your question in short, I think some kids should have been kicked out or put away. But frankly, and this is where I sort of came from on my end with the charters, some kids maybe need a different type of school, yeah. right? They meet their needs, right? And that's what I really liked about the charters. Now, I don't know. I think it depends on the charter for sure, especially being in Chicago where I'm at now. Like there are a lot of charter schools here and some I wouldn't send my kids to. Honestly, mm -hmm. um, they run like prisons. To, to be <laughs> uh, honestly. And so I think some kids would benefit from a lot of structure and it, it really it's based on what the individual kid needs. So, yeah, in short, some kids I think should have been given the, the boot um, and it should have been more manageable at least because it does take away from other kids enrichment. Like on yeah. If, if those things, by the way, didn't seem linked, the first part of what you were responding to, um, the, the kind of disability portion is like, when it's behavioral, I think we really got to get down to what can we back with real scientific studies. And the question I had that I think I have some educated hypotheses for was that the lack of tough love, the lack of discipline is leading to that behavior. <clears throat> uh, it seems like mercy is great, but so is justice. And so it was, I think, a situation in which unlimited mercy was being dispensed and a smidgen of justice with that mercy would have balanced things out. And so other words for mercy and justice that have less religious connotations are what any organization and anyone dealing in organization theory has to talk about, which is standardization and exceptions. As any organization grows, they make standardized procedures and policies. And as any ma and pa shop knows, the invention of the baker's dozen, for example, 13 donuts rather than 12, is given as an exception to your dumbbenyoch, to the to the people who you see most often, because that person is playing the long term. So the dispensation of of justice and mercy, I think, was a, a little topsy turvy, which led to some of that behavior. And, and by the way, there's a separate discussion in SPED about integrated SPED, which a lot of the schools I've been most recently in actually have non-SPED and general ed in the same classroom. So the integrated versus the segregated, the environment we were in is a totally SPED classroom. Yeah. And we don't want to make this direct analogy, but it's the analogy of nonviolent prisoners with violent prisoners in, in the prison system. 
And what effect does that have, especially when you look at the recidivism rates after the fact? You know, you have a bunch of people who are in for marijuana or, you know, sex work, and then you have people who are in for theft and murder. Are those the same thing? Um, and what does putting everybody in, in that pool or that environment, does that have zero effect? Does it have a little effect? Does it have a lot of effect? I, these are a lot of questions and I'm not, I'm not answering these, yeah. but it seems that sometimes they, they're not even considered, like it's not even something on, on, on the table. And so it does seem like we were at least on the same page, you know, back then and, and kind of, kind of still now, but, um, but yeah, it was, um, what, what was the idea you wanted to, to flesh out? You said now more in the space. Was it related to the mental health or the corporal punishment, corporal punishment in Ethiopia? <laughs> I know people, um, my age and slightly older, I think slightly younger than me. They stopped. I know I have some cousins four years younger than me who even they got this, but they were in Dredawa rather than Addis Ababa, capital city. Definitely the rural area is going to have this more where it's regular. Um, yeah. What is there? I've never seen literature on it. I know people who've gone through that system. I have not gone through that system. Oh, uh, and specifically in Ethiopia. Yeah. Ethiopia. I, I, I know people who've gone through it in Ethiopia. Like, so I have like numerous anecdotes, but I've never actually reviewed any literature on it. Is there, is there something that they say here? Obviously they stopped doing it in the United States. I mean, there's plenty of literature on the effects of, I think, corporal punishment generally on child development for sure. Oh, it's, there's, there are tomes like volumes, um, but and I think well, most of it suggests that I'm I don't want to claim to I mean I'm a licensed mental health provider, a clinician, so I guess I have expertise, but I don't want to say I'm an expert on the topic, but mm -hmm. I also I have a lot of experience with it, and so I think based on the literature and what I've seen, I don't think it's a good thing. Um, I think it should stop, and I, I think on some level actually I don't think it's that effective, and I, I for a few reasons actually, I, I think. And I think this actually goes in hand in hand sort of what you're speaking to before around like um, discipline or like not making exceptions or I think in, in as many words like being strict, right? Um, and I think I don't want to get too theoretical or anything like that. I think a lot of Ethiopian households and black households, a black American um, de um, descendants of slaves, if we want to be specific, I think they all have generally authoritarian households, right? In terms of not just with corporal punishment, but I think how how rules are, how ch children are treated and seen, like to be seen and not heard, or excuse me, yeah, to be seen and not heard, right? But the point around corporal punishment, um, I, I have a strong stance, and I work, I've worked so much with Black Americans, um, Latino families, like you name it, on the issue. It's a big issue, right? Um, I, th I think to I'll sort of give reasons right now in terms of why I don't think it's effective. So like. Reason number one, typically when someone is getting hit for do doing something bad, you're typically, in most cases, you're not actually explaining to the kid the behavior you want from them or how to do something different in the face of a challenge, right? Because typically we're punishing a kid for acting out or not obeying or, or whatever it is. And we're not actually teaching them the social skills of how to act. And so the kid only knows what not to do and doesn't know what to do in this situation, typically, right? I think the other piece, and this goes with a lot of the literature on trauma, is when you hit a kid, um, you're typically eliciting a fear response. Like, uh, and a lot of times, it can, not everyone who gets hit is traumatized. Um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say that, but I think what happens, especially as a caretaker when you hit your kid, is not only do they start to learn to fear you, Anytime they get in trouble or anytime they even disapprove, there's a stress response immediately. Like they start to panic for lack of better terms. And we know that's not good for, for development because what happens is when your stress hormones are high and constantly high, especially if you're getting hit often, um, what happens is you actually your ability to access higher order thinking, which kids already suck at, um, is, is nil. It's very hard. We go to our inner brain right? So the amygdala, those almond, almond sized structures in our brain responsible for fear, those get overactive, right? They're like an alarm bells. And so what happens is we get this response from kids quite a bit who are subjected to, to we could say, physical mistreatment or abuse or whatever it is, sometimes even emotionally, 
Like if we're raising our voices a lot, we elicit that fear response. And how it relates now to, let's say, school is if kids can't access higher order thinking, weighing pros and cons of things, they can't manage their impulses. So not only do they not have the skills or get taught the skills, but even neurologically, it's going to be a lot harder um, to be able to control their behavior. And that's what we see when kids get hit. A lot of the literature, at least what I'm aware of, what it says is at best, it'll have no impact. Uh, what tends to happen is it's not a, it's not very effective even, like to really get what you're wanting out of kids. And so I think what happens in the school setting, and we can talk about the school to prison pipeline, is there is this huge cultural dis disconnect in terms of, I think, no one, not many people argue this, but what I think is you go into a classroom and you're expected to just sit still. And you'll see parents when they're with their kids, sit down, like stop, mm -hmm. there, right? <laughs> Teachers don't talk to you that way, typically. And so if you don't have that conditioning, and we've already acknowledged that it's hard to manage your impulses if you're going through a lot of physical mistreatment and you don't know how to act anyway, um, kids are going to cut up. Like they're going to like mess mess around a lot or it's going to be hard. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't excuse like poor behavior or anything like that. I still believe in having standards for kids. But I, I think that's what, in my mind, I think that's what explains a lot of what's going on with the school to prison pipeline. I know racial bias is a thing too. Like I do think whether it's culturally how kids express their anger or it's how teachers tend to look at black kids, I think it looks different when they act up uh, at times. That might be a controversial thing, not always, um, but I think there's something different perhaps. And I think the bias can come in where, okay, someone, I feel threatened because they're angry and upset with me or they're not listening or I can't control them, right? And, and, and then what, they go to the office or you hear the, the story, six-year-old get put, puts in handcuffs or suspended or whatever it is. So I think that's like my short spiel. And so what I really try to emphasize with parents, and I think, I guess this is a good platform, platform to emphasize, is that doesn't mean don't have standards for your kids. But I think what we need to get in the habit of doing is really explaining to them what, what they're doing, like what it's, what's wrong with it, how to do it differently, and especially to repair after we've given a punishment, I think it's fine to give a punishment, right? And to reward good behavior too. Like you've, I'm sure you've heard like positive rewards or reinforcement, right? I yeah, think they used to like a five to one ratio. Oh, I'm sorry. They used to say they, they used to oh. advocate for like a five to one ratio. If you have any criticism, throw in the five affirmations and somehow sometimes it looks like people are going through the, the motions of it. Yeah. And so I think in sh like, of course, I acknowledge that teachers are strapped, right? Like um, it's it's hard to like in terms of why they run classrooms the way they do, like they need to get compliance and obedience like the way it is like uh, Montessori, you know more more about Montessori than me. I think it's a little different or a lot different, but it, yeah. and, they don't make you sit in a chair. You can right. stand, you can move around, you can sit wherever you want. I was, I was going to say that. I'll, I'll let you keep going because I grew up in a Montessori system and I like the Montessori a lot. I've also been listening to and hearing many approaches of what's called the self-directed. There's a, a, a spectrum. On one end, you have the traditional public school method. And on the far end of the other spectrum, you have self-directed, totally unstructured. And there are a lot of these models in small group homeschool and one-on-one -on -one homeschool. Montessori is towards the self-directed end. However, the teacher is there, a guide, a director, or a directress, prepares an environment in which um, they have limited choices. So they don't have unlimited choices, but they have more than one choice. Like I used to get mad having to enforce having someone to sit in a chair. It's very inane, you know, and it, it seems like you're trying to break them. And it is it's very well documented that this is the factory system adopted from Prussia by the early 20th century reformers in the United States who were explicitly against Dr. Maria Montessori. You have Dewey from which the Dewey decimal system comes in all the school libraries. You have, um, oh my God, I'm forgetting all their names. Uh, Will James. Um, oh my God, Horace Mann. Um, a lot of these these 20th century reformers. <laughs> so it's it's their kind of worldview that we're still stuck with. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 with you. I I don't know anyone who's like super well behaved and who tells tells me you know they were never hit growing up. So just super anecdotally, I don't know anything about it. That's why I said it that way. Everyone 
like in the culture that I've seen growing up. And it's like something you laugh about, you chuckle about. And even in some of the schools, you know, some of the administrators get told by the parents, you know, I'm gonna let you hit my kid, you know, just look the other way. And there's a lot of like unwritten rules when you and see it. it. Not, to, not to cut you off, it happens and, here. Yeah, in America, in Ethiopia, it's not unwritten, it's written. <laughs> In Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, the parents will not only give permission for the teachers and the administrators, but for the neighbors. Like, there's no escaping it. It's it's a totality. And I know people who grew up in that environment. And, you know, so you're saying the literature could say probably has no impact. And it was something else that probably um, sent them that way. I don't know. I have not, I've not done any study like that. So I, from my experience, I, I, I don't know anyone like, like that. Like I said, it was super well behaved and was never spanked or anything. So, but for me, like you said, I firmly, what I know and I firmly believe in and have seen experientially is what you were saying about consistency and what you were saying about consequences. Like whatever the consequences are, if you articulate consequences, you have to follow through. Otherwise they will not respect you. That, that I know for sure. And then what do those consequences look like? And, you know, are you adapting them? And then, like you said, are you articulating in a proper manner the type of behavior that you wish to see? That is a great question. And especially if there's a language barrier, if we're talking about bilingual and trilingual communities, that becomes a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And the, the school setting is, it's an interesting one for many reasons. And I think what I was trying to get to earlier that I didn't spend much time on is just the, the demands on the teachers. Like they really in the, the modern system and we can be specific in poor schools, um, the standards are high in terms of like making sure like a lot might be failing and they need to secure funding, right? And like they need test scores. And so you need kids to like focus, uh, hunker down and like get through the curriculum. And so I acknowledge that if there are behavioral issues you have to run your class like a dictatorship, like <laughs> honestly. And so I validate- A benevolent dictator. Honestly. And so like, uh, I validate that. And I think, especially in the school system, I think it's getting better on some level, at least with like giving mental health supports or like uh, training teachers with social emotional learning. Now that looks different, different places. But I think just like highlighting some of that stuff. And I think one big thing is, I think teachers are being more trauma informed, meaning we assume that kids in our classrooms have been exposed to some sort of trauma, right? Because uh, many have, and I think it's worth plugging, I think it's Nadine Burke Harris's ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Events Study, which is like, it's it's big. It's very longitudinal, like it was years and years that they tracked, and long story short, it asked like 10 or so questions around, um, have you ever, well, did you grow up in a household um, where there's physical abuse, or where you experienced sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or if, a parent was somehow incapacitated, um, may have used substances, may have had mental illness, was a parent incarcerated, so on. What we know is if you answer three or four plus, you can predict almost, I think, I don't want, I want, to, be, I don't want to be loose with my language, but there's a high, high correlation with adverse outcomes, health outcomes specifically, which is what they were tracking around like hypertension, diabetes, but especially around even substance use. I'm sure um, incarceration is a part of that. Right. So to be trauma informed, I think, is assuming that kids come in with some of this stuff. Now, that doesn't mean, well, once again, you lower the standards, but I think you really are mindful of how are you approaching them? Are you in their face trying to get their compliance? Are you raising your voice out of nowhere, generating a startle response? Honestly. And so it does. I think when people hear it, they're like, oh, that's pussy stuff or don't baby these kids. Oh, this is a soft generation. It might be in some ways. I won't have that discussion. But I think there's a smarter way to do it. And I think that's what I try to coach a lot of parents through. Now, I think I work with a higher SES clientele now than I used to, but for the majority of my career, it was having these conversations around, I get why you do it, why you might raise your voice or why you might hit your kids. People take pride in it. It's a cultural thing. And how's it working? Especially if you're in my therapy office, it's not. And so we got to <laughs> like, seriously. Yeah, that's... Um... That's good. That's a good transition. So we kind of uh, talked about that, right? In your credentialing and your transition from education to therapy. What made you want to focus on this aspect? Is there any connection between there or was it just like the education, a time for you to self-reflect on what it was that you wanted 
to spend, you know, the rest of your life on? It, w- it was for sure associated with my time at City Year and doing some other, I think, more direct action sort of service um, in the community. Um, I think a part of it is- Parks, right? Yeah, no, for real. And no, I can speak a little bit to that for sure as contributing to why I chose to do what I'm doing. Um, I think some of it's my own upbringing. I think Ethiopians, uh, we, this could be a topic in its own. I think there's a lot of unresolved trauma in a lot of families just by virtue of force them we call the pushback here and all that everything the that communi- communist revolution in right and so the red tear like mm-hmm. like that that's the thing right on top of whatever was going on in somebody's household so to answer your question i think i'd seen the outcomes of some of those um but to to take it to the education and community setting when i was at city i was making dcfs calls like and that it was the kids what is that acronym? Um, I should know this off the top of my head. Department of Child and Family Services. Okay, yeah. CPS. Or maybe California. C- no, I think it's DCFS in California still. But we know it as CPS, Child Protective Services, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we are mandated reporters. Um, anytime we see or know about any sort of even suspect an inkling of abuse, we yeah. must report. We don't investigate. We just raise the flag, whatever it is, right? And so I, what I found is the most behaviorally challenged kids are the ones for whom I'd have to make calls. And these are things that are traumatic, like forms of abuse. Um, one, I did report. The other, I found out about later, even that a kid was going through something. All yeah, of which- I've only had to do it once after like two to three years of, of being in it. I've only ever had to do it once. And it was it was very obvious and it was very disheartening what the student was doing you know, is around self-harm. I don't want to get into specifics, but it, I saw it once. I wasn't sure. And then I saw it again. I was like, okay, this is it. And, and so I think a lot of that for me, I don't know if you want to call it jarring, but was just like, no wonder they can't sit still. No wonder some of their language is sexualized. No wonder they're confrontational with other students, right? related to trauma. And I didn't have that language at the time, but obviously making these connections. And so, of course, I treated, I think, the kids with empathy. Of course, I still had the high standards, but I think could give them some warmth. But what even, so that was a big reason. I was like, I think I need to do something in mental health. And so when I did, I worked for, what was it? Um, the, what was it? The, the office of like gang reduction youth development grid um, through the, the city of Los Angeles. They have summer night lights which was an experience in and of itself. But second to last day of programming, there was an incident of violence where basically one person was stabbing the other and I had to break it up, right? And I think what got me, not just that incident, obviously that was like difficult to manage um, and brought up a lot for me, but I think more than that, it was the reactions that I saw that troubled me a lot, which was, um, I think indifference, really we would call it desensitization um, the fact that they're exposed to so much violence, they're like, what of it? What does it matter? And so for me, that was just a huge disconnect. And I think my 23 year old self was like, what the hell is wrong with these people? Like, why don't you see the problem? Like, how could you just, and I think I had issues with the fact that no one was stepping in, which we know with trauma, we have fight, flight and freeze responses. Some people freeze up and don't do anything. Some people will run away, right? I think some people were still guilty of not jumping in, if I'm being honest, but beyond that, <laughs> Honestly, guilty like, bystander. But we had gang intervention workers in oh, what shit. situations was about them. So, was like, and now I don't want to say too much. Now I'm already talking yeah. too much. But so that's that's what that was, right? So I think with that, I really like harped on that. Really thought about that, and I was just like, there's something to it in terms of like. And I, I think one thing we were exposed to in City Year, um, the guy's name is he's an educator, like a radical educator in Oakland, Jeff Andrade Duncan. I think is his name. And I think he had some documentary of some program like Roses Through the Concrete or something like that. And so they piloted, They he basically said like a lot of these kids have some form of PTSD. This is why they're acting the way they're acting. They get jumpy, they get startled, they don't feel safe, they misbehave. It looks like externalization of these behaviors. And so all of that during that time just clicked for me. I was like, okay, I think I'll be a social worker, right? Or like get my clinical licensure and like try to work with youth that's always what I've done. Now I work with adults, but yeah, that's sort of what got me here. That's dope. That's dope. And once you got into that, 
did they filter you into adults because you had to? Did you have the option? What goes into the decision making of like the subcategories or the do you call it the emphasis? Yeah, it, it could be emphasis, field of whatever it is. Like, um, it's a good question because in graduate school you do internships, and so in these internships they're random. At least the first one you get, you don't choose. And the second one, like you apply for various ones, so you can be specialized in an area. Not that doesn't mean you're going to get the internship you want, but it'll be the field. And so coming in, you know, I was actually upset that I got put in a school again. I was like, I need something different. Like I've always been in schools. And so I did a program out here called um, Becoming a Man. Um, it's through the organization Youth Guidance. It's an excellent program. Had a lot of backing, um, not just by the mayor's office, but by um there are a lot of um i think there was a longitudinal study but for sure qualitative and quantitative studies on the effectiveness done by the university of chicago's crime lab so like it was justified verified some people have raised issues with the methodologies of some of it i think the shit works so i'm not gonna like i was it. gonna say I, I feel like some people will raise issues with the name <laughs> it's problematic <laughs> <laughs> like, in the frame but, well like okay so with some of that i think what was so interesting and cool and i think is important to speak about between two black men here is I think a lot of the young men and I'm um, in Chicago it was a high school I was at um you know the the misconception or the question I'd be asked a lot is they want to do therapy like they'll talk to you um and my response is they're yearning for this in wow. some school. Uh, they may not articulate in the ways you and I do and they'll get mad when we call it group therapy like no 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 I go to BAM what do you mean I'm not in therapy ain't nothing wrong with me okay cool so like it, it's a it's a very I that's funny that, they just call it by the acronym like it's its own thing huh and i think that's the that's yeah. secret sauce right um be, and and th that's honest because of course it's it has cbt in it cognitive behavioral therapy um it's it's uh what what's called like a rites of passage program yeah. right and so strong sense of like group camaraderie um completing missions and things like that. And so I, I think the secret sauce is it gives kids a, a sense of belonging, that there's something, they're part of something bigger than themselves. And, and, they're and being it's boys involved. only, right? It's prohibited. Now, I know there have been debates that? Yeah. Um, if there are trans identifying kids or non-binary kids, if they can join, I frankly don't know how they're handling that. Um, I know there is a counterpart, WOW, working on womanhood. Yeah which is a great program in and of itself. Um, and it is, is a little bit different than BAM, but- um, I think there are less, just as a super educated guess, but how I've seen it play out in sports, there are less issues of female to male than male to female. In general, it seems to be. Or are you saying it's more of an issue with, with uh, wait, say that again? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I- So I've seen it play out in sports and especially in combat sports, which I'm most interested in jujitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, etc. I have never seen anyone complain about any trans person who goes female to male entering any of those sports. Any right. and all complaints have been in the opposite direction of those who transition from male to female. Gotcha. I have never seen a complaint the other direction. Um, no. So I, I, I don't know if that's the case, but I think an educated guess would be less likely to get a lot of pushback. I mean, m maybe you have a bunch of, you know, whatever uh, kind of cultural taboos around it, but I, I would doubt it. I would bet if you asked me to bet, if I had to bet, I would bet in one direction. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's an interesting hypothetical, I guess. And now I'm just like, damn, okay, it's getting hot now with the, this could be problematic, but <laughs> It's hard to say one way. I, th I think personally, you could make a case either way. I think uh, among males, there can be homophobia, transphobia, whatever it is, and it may be tough. But then I feel like my hunch actually is, especially, I'll be frank, these these groups are black and black and brown kids. And so I think, you know, looking at it from like a black feminist lens, I think they may be inviting of those who identify as, as black women, right, or brown women. So I think I th my hunch would be like they may be more open to that than the boys, or it could be problematic on both ends. Um, I can't say for certain, but I know it's it's been raised. To be honest, I think sadly I don't know if there is as much integration or if these youth feel as empowered to even like come to these spaces. I think mm -hmm. it's had done. I just don't know for certain and what that has looked like. Yeah, but, I I think about it a lot. You know, in terms of you know, uh, I worked around 
DOMA when I was with Denis Kucinich back in 2011 in repealing DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. And, you know, related to that is a lot of the stuff Bill Clinton had, the don't ask, don't tell stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of my really close boys, he served in one of the last non-integrated parts of the military, which is submarines in the Navy. And they have specific reasons for why they don't do that is they have to stay submerged sometimes up to three months. Yeah. And so if any incidents occur, you can't go back to the surface and talking about trauma, that's going to be multiplied tenfold, if not a thousandfold, if you then have to stay in a box under the sea for three months. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of an extreme example, but yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to put you in the hot seat there. Uh, yeah. but the, the greater kind of program that you're talking about, especially when you call it like a rite of passage is, is very interesting. I've been reading some topics related to that. There've been some new books coming out related to that. Therapy is, it's interesting in the law. I used to be an organizational ombudsman for universities and some universities, for example, the university of California system protect the organizational ombudsman really well, but they're protecting it on an internal procedure basis, not on a legal basis. In the law, what we often find is that there are two categories of people who are protected, especially by confidentiality, unless there's physical harm or imminent physical harm to someone else or to the self. And that is the therapist or the psychologist or whatever the title is, and the pastor or the priest. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that the legal framework has made some connection between those two professions. And my, my uh, former pro profession as an organizational ombudsman, hearing people while I was neither licensed therapist nor lawyer in that position, there were elements of both of those fields that I used and had a certain confidentiality. While I was in North Dakota, I didn't have that highest level of confidentiality, especially not for sexual harassment cases. But when I worked in the University of California system, I had full protection except for imminent harm to self and to others. Yeah. So but it, it's interesting. Like I said, larger position, you could throw organizational ombudsman in there, but a lot of people don't know what that is. Most people know what a psychologist or a priest is. Yeah. Um, and I remember talking to some of the people that I talked to and sometimes, you know, being the person I am, you could probably guess it. And this is, you know, another great segue. I see a, uh, like the way you said these boys are getting some sort of relief from BAM and from the rites of passage aspect of it, it seems as if the growingly secular society we're in, and I believe that secularization came from a kind of uh, ever devolving Protestantism, which is a discussion for another day. But I believe this, however we got here, what it's missing out on are the mechanisms that were in Catholicism, Orthodox Christianity, the Syrian Church of the East, and even more ancient, perhaps pagan traditions all over the world. And that is the kind of usually in that environment, fatherly figure who hears the confession of the person. Have you, have you ever wondered about the kind of that religious connection between, you know, in the movies, it's typically a Catholic priest, but that, that role of kind of person who hears those things, um, they don't have the training that you do, but they have a different training. And, and sometimes if they disconnect the spirit from the body, I think they're off base, but do you see any connections there? And does religion or spirituality, if they don't want to be attached to any organized religion, play any, any role in, in therapy, or is it mostly a secular, um, session and i know that may that may that may differ from therapist to therapist it does i think it's an excellent question though i think it's even just to backtrack i mean this is so obvious to you i'm preaching to the choir i guess <laughs> to, the, to the deacon you preach it to the deacon it's another level <laughs> so um when though when we experience our toughest times where we feel helpless or we've been through a trauma or where we feel like we are not in control of our life in a way that feels like inherently scary to us we lean on faith on some or some spirituality. People tend to, not everybody, of course, as you know, but it's it's something so important. And I think any therapist who denies that, I don't, I don't know if they're they're worth their weight in gold. However you want to put that. <laughs> but but honestly, because 
that doesn't mean we have to have a spirituality of our own, but this resonates with so many people. And I'll be honest with a lot of um, black people for sure. Um, I think where we can go many places with this, honestly, because I mean, there are many therapists who adhere to, and I know you have opinions on this, maybe more um, secular spirituality um, or like those who like adhere to like energy and um, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, like zodiacs and all that. Um, and so I think a lot of people are into that. I don't want to speak down to what I know I was using dismissive language, but more so I think a lot of people resonate with this. If we want to talk about what's popular in the field, whether it's having crystals or whatever it is, this is spirituality. Um, I think even taking it back to my work at BAM, we do a check-in every single day. And that check-in, it's an acronym PIES, P-I-E-S. P is physically, I is intellectually what we may be thinking about. E is emotions, what we're having. S is spiritually, where you're at. And what that means is to whom are we connected in some sort of way to a higher power, to someone close to us? And of course, we're not just talking about we're close, like there's something else there, right? And so I think in terms of, I've used that check-in with youth. I've in the past even said, I feel connected to God, like I do. Um, and kids are okay with that. And some people say they don't. I, I preface it in the past when I was working with youth, I don't do this as much now, but even if you wanna say you're connected to your dog, Right, that might sound like horrible to some people, but honestly, if you feel that connection, say that. So there's space for whatever you choose to feel spiritually or not to feel. But I think it's good to welcome it in the room because I think it's there typically, especially I'm, I am a trauma therapist on some, I am. I, I hesitate because um, I don't even know why I hesitate. I'm in a trauma program right now, so I'm a trauma therapist. And so I, I work with families as well. And spirituality is a big part of what gets people through tough times. Like, absolutely. So I think, to your example, even, I encourage folks to even, if they have faith, especially if what we know is isolation can kill us. And when we've been through a trauma, we tend to isolate quite a bit. Or if we're depressed, we isolate. So I say, like, get your ass to church. Or go somewhere. <laughs> I'm just like, go, can you go to church? Can you go to the bar? Something. Like, but like I'm saying, like, church, where, you, where you're connected to something, like, greater than yourself. Or even if it's a political cause. Now, I think people, and I'm sure you have opinions on this, maybe looking to politics for some of that stuff. And I don't yeah. think they're gonna find what they're looking for, if I'm being honest about that. And so, but if, if that's what people need to feel connected and I always, so I always say spirituality is important. We need to check where they're at with that. We say even like, we need to do a biopsychosocial, spiritual assessment of where people are at. Every like a 360, what's important to them? What are their supportive factors? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's totally apocryphal or if it was a real story. I had heard this story of Barack Obama at one time, you know, he had his early communist affiliations and at one point was wanting to check out a group of atheists. And when he went there, he found a bunch of people who were stuck in their theories, but didn't want to play anything out in a political perspective. And what he found in the black church was a lot of people who were politically active. Obviously some of those people like Jeremiah Wright, you know, ended up being in some hot spots that maybe get him in trouble. But in general, it was a, a community that seemed to be on the same page in terms of organizing. So the way you said it, like, especially in the marketplace of, of the United States, there are many different options to choose from and, and what that looks like. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in, in the idea. I, I, I wouldn't want you to speculate wildly, but I wonder if you converse with any colleagues if you're allowed to and I, I would I would wonder you know how many do you think actually engage in like the world organized religions of you know be it Hinduism Buddhism Shintoism Islam Christianity Judaism Sikhism and even Zoroastrianism for that fact, for that matter like I would genuinely wonder how many engage in that versus what you were saying the the crystal zodiac um whatever it may be that, that people are, are looking for. I, I think human beings, witchcraft. Um, yeah, witchcraft. <laughs> I've been seeing things in the New York and the New York times about that in, uh, in people in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So like, I, th uh, to, I guess to answer your question, I don't, my assumption at least is I don't think a lot of people would hear or maybe like in, in name or my, a, a very common example is those who are Jewish, right? Like ethnically, of course, they identify as such and feel like a tie to that religiously, most people I bet not as much, but some people do. 
So I don't want to downplay that either. Um, I think the same for Christianity. I think I have to be honest with myself. I think I've been and you, as you know, different places with my own faith in terms of like belief and everything like that. And so I, I think overall people are engaging in some sort of spirituality. I think, I think Marx was onto something when he said it's the opiate, uh, opiate of the masses, or at least it was, I think in the manifesto, the communist manifesto. I don't know if it was angles or anything. Anyway. So I, I think, I think there's something to that. We need to lean on something, but I think, the reason, as you highlight, it's so important to the Black political tradition, um, and I think to trauma survivors generally or specifically, is this notion of hope, right? And however you want to define hope as like believing, I guess, in something um, that you don't know will happen or whatever could happen, whatever it is, but like believing that something better could be or that there is something. We need that on some level, and I think faith or spirituality is a part of that. That's, that's beautiful. And so that we don't get stuck in the clouds, I want to get back into the dirt and that acronym you hit us with, PIES. That first one, I believe, was physical or physicality. One of the things I know that you've experimented with in your life, you know, coming onto my program, looking as swole as you are right now, is uh, working out, training, or, or lifting weights. What, what has been your progress, ups and downs? You know, I've had my own via pandemic or pre-pandemic, you know, throughout all this time of working in these traumatic environments, what has been your relationships to that iron or to that steel? Man, um, as of late or in general? It could be however you want to answer it. Um, man, I, I guess like a lot of people, I got introduced to lifting weights um, as a football player. Um, I think, yeah. What I position like, were you? Oh, so you know me, I used to be a lot bigger, like more body fat for sure. And I, I, I was defensive end or defensive tackle and like offensive tackle, offensive guard. So definitely on the line. Oh, line. I played end as well. Okay. So sometimes linebacker when we blitz or fake blitz. We, we Abisha, you know what I'm saying? No, I don't need to say more, any more than that. We're a little bit at a disadvantage um, in terms of size or whatever it is, but I know I, I, I personally, I've always been bigger, but even still, like, I think that's what really drew me to the weights. I was like, like, I need to really, I, cause I used to be a basketball player too. And so I was like, okay, I have some footwork, whatever I need to get. So like I got back into it. I was off of lifting weights for a while. Like when I didn't play football, I was like, for what? Got back around when we were doing city or actually just as a way to kind of let some steam off um, as a form of self care, honestly. Um, and so I got back on school and I was doing all of this trauma work actually like whether it was with BAM or another organization I worked for I needed an outlet for like my mental health emotional health whatever it was and so I've been doing it since consistently from like 2016 till now the pandemic definitely threw a wrench in a lot of that um I was definitely doing the whole at-home workout started with the water jugs on the broomstick hey um, man I, it's embarrassing I got some weights that didn't fit as well as like a curl bar and I was doing some like complex and I actually like injured myself or like gave oh, myself. No. Um, I like was doing a vertical press and like caught my chin. So that put me out for a little bit in terms of training. Um, then I actually got COVID myself and had to like sideline again. Um, so like it's been very up and down. So, yeah, there's, there's the average, I've said this before and elsewhere, the average millennial gain is like 30 pounds, man. And I gained 30 pounds. I like to tell people yeah. it was 15 pounds muscle, 15 pounds fat. Yeah. I don't know, but I just got through a 10 pound cut after that. So, you know, now I got 20. So hopefully it's 15 muscle, five fat, but we'll see. We'll do a little more work. Um, but, but yeah, do you, do you have any particular favorite lifts? The press is, is great. Were you sitting, standing, jumping? Oh, what I what I tend to do generally, my split is um, I'll, I'll usually work out four days a week um, and I'll do like a push day, pull day, leg day and just kind of rotate. Right. And so I always try to incorporate a, a compound lift with each of those days. So on the push day, it's going to be bench and definitely some version of an incline. If I'm not trying to gasp, if I'm trying to really get at it after it, I'll do an overhead press as well. Right. That's you'll get a lot. Of, I always say be efficient and like get the most bang for your buck, make sure you're lifting safely and with good form, of course. Um, leg days, I'll do squat. The pull days, I'll definitely center it around like a deadlift, if not uh, some sort of barbell row. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's sort of the money and then I just kind of build around it. Like with any Beautiful. Sport. And 
Is that something they teach you in school to incorporate, for example, lifting weights in therapy, or is it anything that you apply with your clients, or is it just a personal thing? Um, I think it's a personal thing, but I remember one of my professors put it like, your work or your world, and I think a lot of people who go into the helping profession struggle with this, your world cannot be your work, right? Because I think we see ourselves as helpers. I mean, you're in the clergy, you're, you're a deacon, right? Um, we identify strongly and firmly with these things. And what we have to do to avoid burnout, to avoid secondary traumatic stress, if we're hearing some traumatic things, to avoid compassion fatigue, um, we need to why we need to add pieces to our pie. The whole pie cannot be our work, right? So for they're like exercise could be a great thing with that. And what we know, especially if we're getting activated physically a lot um, with what we're doing throughout the day, whether it's stress, whether we're bearing witness to traumas, we need to regulate our system, our nervous system in some sort of way. Yoga is a great one that I try to do when I have time so we can access our parasympathetic nervous system. But I think for me, lifting weights has been a great outlet for that. Just some sort of pressing movement, something to get that out, right? Now we have to be careful about overdoing it, of course, and not taxing our nervous system. But long story short, I think they recommended some sort of movement, which I recommend to my patients. Hell, if you're going for a walk, do that. Um, but just something to move. We need to be moving, right? To like regulate our nervous system, to stay healthy. So yeah, that, I think those are the main reasons. Yeah, I've, I've felt it. I've let myself go, played with different diets. You know, at one point at the same height, I gained 100 pounds and then, you know, dropped 50. Um, and then, you know, pandemic gained 30. So I've I've yo-yoed on that. And I've I just know I think better. And, so, you know, you, you've had these categories, intellect, spirit, body. When I feed the body, that feeds the intellect and that 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 feeds the spirit as well. Like these things feed into each other. And I've I've been in those academic environments where it seems like there's just a great neglect of the body and everyone's focusing on either the intellect or the spirit, however that's interpreted. So I'm I'm so glad, you know, whether it, it makes it to therapy or not, that on a personal level that that you're taking care of it and do you have kind of an open view of it, but that you got the iron, <laughs> a man of, uh, of numbers and a man of, of, uh, iron, but also a man of, of letters. I think one of the more interesting things, this is not really related, but it's related to, to my channel. So I got to bring it up You're an Ethiopian American born and raised. And you're one of the few Ethiopian Americans I know who can read and write. And if, if I'm, sure you could correct me if i'm wrong you didn't learn in the orthodox church although i'm sure you've got some practice from whenever you had visited that before and after but you learned in the in the university environment can you can you tell folks about that because i'm always trying to encourage people to learn and i've been building a lot of asynchronous materials on my channel as well almost deaf oh uh, man the fido uh so uh, you know like many diaspora parents, they try to put their kids in a modern yes school. Like I did that like at nine and 10, wasn't paying much attention. All I could remember was like, ha and buh, that's it. <laughs> Anything. Now I might've got some muscle memory in, in terms of like writing things, but I didn't remember a damn thing. I'm not fluent in a modern yeah. I can understand it okay, barely speak or put some things together. But beyond that, so when I got to college, I needed a foreign language. And so I was like, shit, like, what am I going to do? Man, what did you do in Spanish? Uh, excuse me, what did you do in high school? You do Spanish oh, or French yeah. or something? Well, I did Spanish, but uh, I failed uh, one one quarter. I didn't get the full three classes or the series. I only got to Spanish two because one semester I messed up. But, yeah, long story. Played football. I got, it, got, it got nixed, but I never had what I needed to graduate college, right? That's like an entry thing, like when you get there um, to be able to graduate. So you at the school that I went, you need that third whatever course or year of, of a language. And so the two is like the minimum. And so I needed a language and interestingly, the school I was at, um, I guess I'll just say University of Washington, um, they offered not just a Maringa, but Tigrinya. That's how deep we are out there. Like, so, so, <laughs> like, but like yeah, we're, we're deep out there. And so like they, they were able to cater to it. So it was an awesome, my brother did it before me because I would have been intimidated. I'm like, how the hell am I going to learn that? So like what I'll say to folks, whether it's on your channel or whatever it is, um, it's very, it's very, very doable. Like I learned the alphabet, I think, and it's what 300 something characters, but like 
only a certain amount of base characters per vowel or sound or whatever it is. But I learned it in like two weeks. Oh, like that's people, quick. That's quick. It, it took me a month and a half. So you, two weeks is quick. Maybe for me, it's because like, I'm not great with auditory hearing things and retaining, but like, I think writing things helps me a lot. So it's really, I encourage people a lot of repetition. So yeah. I was writing with single letters, like a million times, just like people are like, above that. And they forget that when they were children, how many times in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, did you have to do standards and trace the little letters? Like how many repetitions, like lifting weights, how many reps do you think you got of the Latin alphabet we use in English? But when yeah. it comes to the Giz alphabet that we use in Amharic, nobody wants to put those reps in. Yeah. So, and that, that honestly, you, you hit the nail on the head. You got to, yeah, if you put the reps in, because for me, you don't got to be that smart to do it. You just got to put the work in, right? To just like absorb at least that. Now to learn the language, that's a little harder, but like to get the, the letters down, I think it's very doable. And I think the other piece, of course, is reading and fluency. That was hard and blending Amarinya words. I guess I had the advantage like others who grew up in Amharic speaking households of like having some familiarity. Mm -hmm. some of so that helps, but still had to put that work in. And I do, which, man, I know you had me reading when we worked at Sydney here. <laughs> like, no, you put these standards. I was like, all right, all right, all right, all right. Or going to church and like going to choir practice, right? And like trying to read on the screen. So like all of that, it's practice, man, just reading it. Um, I even, I do it, like I follow some folks even on Instagram that might use Amharic, um, Fidel, like mm -hmm. and whatever they're typing, I'll just read on there. Like just get that, get those reps in. Cause for a while oh, I won't, then you're in my head, bro. Like, come on, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. So like, I'm still, when I can, I'm still doing it. Yeah, I'm glad I was in your head because you already did the hard thing. Like people getting over the alphabet, that's the hardest part for people initially. So for you, it's just, maintaining like you're in maintenance mode and while you're in maintenance mode you slowly add vocabulary like i've been literate in amharic now for 10 years i've spoken it my entire life but i was only literate 10 years ago and in this 10 years i've learned more amharic than in my first 20 years and that's because i don't have to practice on anyone else Actually, it's one of these gang programs that they had at our school. I used to pop in in the library. This is one of these like scared straight programs where they, they say, oh, we're going to bring all the badass kids before and then get some gangsters and get some people who've been out the uh, prison, did a bit or two to come talk to them. I, I popped my head in a couple of times and listened to them. And one of the genius things I never forget that they told us is they were instilling to them the love of reading. And they were telling them, you know, when you have like a really great conversation with someone else and they were saying like the greatest distilled thoughts of a person. And so thus the most beautiful conversation, you have access to that. I think they attributed it to like Malcolm X. I, I've never heard it anywhere else, but in that library, I heard this and I believe that in Amharic, like I've always been a person who just use all my aunties, grandmas, everybody. I consider them free language teachers. So I would just practice on them all the time. And, uh, but get, getting access to the books. So my, that, that sharpened my verbal skills, but getting access to the books actually helped me correct my language. There was a lot of my language that needed correcting because you hear it and you don't know how it's written. Sometimes the, the spoken word, I should say many times, if not more times than not, the, the spoken word is off from, from the written word. So, you know, I also have the thing where my parents left during the time of the king. So there's a lot of language change during communism and federal democracy. So there's that element to it too. So reading the Bible to see the ancient Amharic or the archaic Amharic, but then also reading news or, and seeing people on Facebook, like you said, or on Instagram or, or Twitter. Twitter is probably the where I see it the most, but Facebook too. People have long posts in Amharic. I still practice and see how it's it's spoken and it's it's great. So I'm 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 glad that you're still doing it right now. Actually, <laughs> that was a subtle check in on you. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be real with you. It's just maintenance. I'm not expanding, but it just yeah, making sure everything's still well oiled and working. Well, that that's a beautiful thing, man. We got to touch on schooling. Got to touch on therapy. We got to touch on physicality and lifting weights, spirituality, and and language learning in any of these categories or. Or anything else do you have any closing remarks or anything you want to plug for the good people at home whether it be your resources or other resources oh man um 
And I think generally, especially, I think it's important to sort of say during this time, maybe we're sort of seeing the light with the pandemic, but I think just really emphasizing the importance of checking in with yourself, even if you're doing that pies check-in, but just really taking inventory of note of where you're at emotionally. I know a lot of people have been struggling during this time. Run um, through the acronym for us again. Physically in your body, just how you're feeling. Like, are you feeling tense? Is your hands sweating? Like, what's going on? Feeling tight anywhere? Anything feel good? Just take an inventory. Intellectually, it's more so just what thoughts are you having right now? Like what's running in your head? Just take an inventory of that. And emotions, and this can be hard for a lot of folks if we don't have access to our emotions regularly, but just like checking in and saying like, what am I feeling right now? Like, especially if we feel like we're doom scrolling or zoning out or um, numbing with the internet, which everybody's doing on some level, take time to even just check in with that. And spiritually, who are you feeling connected to? Even if it's not a higher power or anything like that, like, are you connected to someone right now? And really just to normalize, like get the, get therapy, man. I, I do therapy as a clinician. It's important to do it. I encourage it. So I think that's what I would plug is just destigmatizing, I think, mental health, especially for Abishas, African-Americans generally, um, like get your ass into therapy. If not, at least go to church. <laughs> so- <laughs> I, I, I mean, exactly. It's the link, uh, Ethiopia. All right. I'm going to say Appreciate you having me on here.